Uh, Justice DM, yes. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, anybody can answer the question? President Marcos declared martial law because that power was vested in the 1935 Constitution. President Gloria Marapagal Arroyo declared martial law because it was in the Constitution. President Duterte exercised the power to declare martial law because it is in the Constitution. If the power of martial law is so horrific, my question is, why is it still in the Constitution? What is the absolute necessity of retaining that power to declare martial law in the Constitution? So any one of the council may answer that question. Your Honor, there is no debate that under the Constitution, the President has the power, extraordinary power, to declare martial law and suspend the writ of habeas corpus. But that power is not absolute. It is circumscribed by the very Constitution itself, which provides safeguards against the abuses and excesses of martial law and the suspension of the writ. The, con the Constitution provides the answer to the question of the Honorable Justice. The Constitution says martial law or suspension of the writ can only be exercised by the President when there is actual rebellion or invasion, invasion and public safety requires it. So, uh, if there is no rebellion and public safety does not require it, then the declaration, the proclamation of martial law or its extension can be invalidated by this honorable court under section 18 of article 7 of the Constitution. Should we not look at the provision of the Constitution on martial law as a reasonable necessity because it is a device, a tool given to government to defend the state, although in the process it may result in curtailment of civil liberties or infringement of individual freedom, rather than as a device to violate human rights and to infringe on individual freedom, because that seems to be the thrust. And uh, Solicitor Hilby mentioned the theater of war. If it is that such a mon monstrosity, I don't think the framers of the Constitution were so callous, insensitive to the possible effects of martial law to continue to retain that provision in the Constitution. Well, Your Honor, again, there is no debate that uh, the provision on the declaration of martial law and suspension of the writ is in the Constitution as a necessity to protect the sovereignty of the state. But again, it is circumscribed by many limitations. Uh, counsel, in Lagman versus Medial Dia, the court made a pronouncement that there is rebellion in Mindanao, and so we sustain the declaration by the president of martial law in that area. The petitions seek before pending before us seek a declaration by this court to strike down the act of Congress in granting the extension as unconstitutional necessarily it would entail 
an act on the part of this court to declare that there is no more rebellion in Mindanao, how do you propose we come about in making that conclusion? Well, Your Honor, under the Constitution, this Honorable Court has the specific and the special jurisdiction to determine the sufficiency of the factual basis for the proclamation or extension. So, uh, if this Honorable Court would uh, find and determine that there is no actual rebellion now in uh, Mindanao and there is no necessity for the March law to be extended in, uh, in answer to the requirement of public uh, safety, then this Honorable Court is equipped by the Constitution with such jurisdiction. Now, Justice Antonin Scalia of the U.S. Supreme Court adheres to the strict textual interpretation of the Constitution. Essentially, he says, he said that if it is in the Constitution, then it is there. If it is not in the Constitution, it is not there. Now, my question is, in vesting upon this court the power of judicial review of the Declaration of Martial Law or its extension, it merely vests upon this court the mandate to ascertain the sufficiency of the factual basis. So my question is, I, I, I read the petitions, and invariably all of the petitions raise the matter of grave abuse of discretion. But there is nothing in that particular provision of the Constitution that compels this court to ascertain whether there is grave abuse of discretion. Concomitantly, the four petitions also make mention of human rights violations to be considered by the court. But in the express provision of the Constitution, there is nothing there that, sh that compels us to consider the human rights violation dimension in ascertaining whether we should strike it down as unconstitutional. How do you respond to that, Counsel? Well, Your Honor, uh, as we have said in our opening statement, we cited Section 1 of Article 8 only as ancillary to our main invocation of this court's jurisdiction under Section, section 18 of Article 7. We also said that uh, our challenge can succeed even if we do not prove grave abuse of discretion because that is the requirement under uh, Section 1 of Article 8. We only made an, a citation of uh, this court's expanded judicial review jurisdiction to place in context, to place under a magnifying glass the abuse of discretion or arbitrariness of the Congress in granting the request of the President for an extension. With respect to human rights, it is precisely because a martial law regime or suspension of the writ could spawn violation of human rights that we are saying the President and Congress must not be trigger happy in declaring or proclaiming martial law or extending the duration of martial law and of the writ. We have a constitutional duty to decide the case within a constitutional deadline of 30 days. And within that 30-day period, 
we have to arrive at a conclusion that there is no rebellion and we will ask the respondents to prove the factual basis for requesting the extension. But are the petitioners also in possession of evidence that would establish that the ground cited by the president in his letter to, the, to Congress requesting for an extension are false or contrived so that we can arrive at a correct and a complete uh, determination whether there is factual basis, sufficiency of factual basis. Your Honor, in uh, the decision of this Honorable Court in Lagman versus Meljardia, this court said that the burden of proof is on the president or the when you executive. Said, sir, when you said that the most or all of the matters written by the president in his letter were contrived, uh, you would not be in a position to submit countervailing evidence to that, probably in your memorandum? Well, we will attempt to do that, Your Honor. Okay. But uh, that should not reverse the situation that the UNOS belongs to the president to prove that there is sufficient factual basis for the extension. All right. One, one last question to you, Congressman Lagman. You have been a member of Congress for many years. And in your petition and the other petitions, there was emphasis on the super majority in Congress that, that you, you implied that they railroaded the approval of uh, the adoption of the resolution uh, granting the extension requested by the press. Is there anything wrong by a supermajority? I thought the rule of the majority is the essence of democracy. Well, Your Honor, uh, there is nothing wrong really with having a supermajority, but there is definitely something wrong if the supermajority railroads its approval of the president's request. Are you asking us, Your Honor, that we should review the internal rules of Congress on how they came about adopting the resolution. It's a separate branch of government. No, Your Honor. We are not asking this honorable court to review the rules of Congress. But we are saying that the Congress, with a super majority, uh, failed to ascertain the basis for the declaration for the ex extension of martial law on the uh, submission of the president in his letter dated December 8, 2017. As a matter of fact, if we compare that letter with, uh, uh, the, joint, with the resolution of both houses number four, the resolution is a virtual copycat version of the uh, letter. So in our memorandum, we will underscore this uh, particular uh, defect. Is it correct to say, Your Honor, that what should properly be reviewed by this court should be the resolutions of Congress granting the extension rather than the act of the President? That is why I'd like to ask you a question. Is it proper to implead the president as respondent in these well, petitions? Well, Your Honor, in the case of the extension of the proclamation or uh, suspension, it is a dual act of uh, the president and the Congress because the extension should be at the initiative of the president and should be approved by the joint session of the Congress. So both should be uh, put to task in not uh, uh, showing the sufficiency of factual basis for such uh, uh, extension, Your Honor. Is there a requirement, a legal or constitutional requirement that mandates Congress to cite the reasons for granting concurrence 
to the request for extension by the president. <laughs> and by the way, I, I also like to ask you whether the argument of the Respondents Council, the Solicitor General, that the absence of the resolution might be fatal to your petitions. How do you respond to that? Yes, sir. Well, eh, Your Honor, Congress must always act based on reason. That is why it is reasonable to expect that Congress would have to make its own determination of the factual uh, basis of the President's request for an extension. Uh, the, the Congress uh, should not uh, just say this is what the President said and amen to what the President said. Did that you... should not be the case. Now, with respect to the absence of uh, our attaching to the petition, the... I'm sorry, uh, I, th I was just informed that uh, we were given already copies yes, of the Honor. resolution. Oh, but let, I could, let me go to another But I point. could explain why we did not uh, uh, attach that to our complaint. Because, to our petition, because despite repeated notice, uh, repeated requests, Your Honor, the Secretary General of the House continuously, uh, continuously said that it was not available. It took this representation to ask this, uh, the Senate Secretary to give us the uh, certified true copy of this uh, resolution, and we were able to get it only on January 8, did 2018. You did you exhaust all remedies available within Congress yes, Your Honor. to seek reconsideration? Can you tell us uh, briefly what recourse did you resort to to seek reconsideration of the Act of Congress before coming to this court? The reconsideration, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, no, no, Your Honor. We did not ask for reconsideration because uh, uh, this was uh, approved on the last day of the session before the Christmas break. You filed the petition during the Christmas break, correct? Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> All right. But, uh, the, well, this, the court then was uh, open, but in the case of Congress, it was closed for the for the Christmas break. And moreover, it is not mandatory for us to seek that reconsideration. You want us to tell the President that instead of declaring martial law, he should just exercise the calling out powers? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Can we do uh, that? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I think in the graduated uh, uh, reaction of the President with respect to uh, emergency situation, the Constitution uh, enumerates in sequence the power of the President. But however, Your Honor, we are not insisting that the President should not uh, declare force martial law or just call the armed forces to repel any violence or even rebellion. Because uh, what we are saying here is when he resorted to asking Congress to extend martial law for another one year, uh, there was no basis for such uh, request, and the Congress failed to validate the request of the President, and one year is too long, Your Honor. I'm perplexed by the provision of the Constitution which says that it's only in case of invasion or rebellion when public safety so requires. And probably this can be answered later on by Commissioner Monsod. Is there any situation where there is invasion but public safety is not endangered? Well, uh, or a situation of rebellion but public safety is not in danger? Yes, well, there could be situations like that. If uh, invasion, like rebellion, is, con is, uh, uh, is uh, imagined or uh, 
contrived. So that would be a situation where uh, there is no actual rebellion, there is yes. no actual invasion, and necessarily public safety requirement. Yes. We are aware that the phrase imminent danger was removed by the framers of the Constitution. So it is the position of petitioners that there should be actual invasion or actual rebellion. What would be your concept of actual rebellion? There should be shooting, a shooting, a shooting war among people. Your Honor, no less does, than this uh, honorable court in uh, Lagman versus Majaldia ruled that for the president to exercise his extraordinary power of declaring martial law or suspending the writ, there should be actual, actual rebellion or invasion. In other words, there should be the theater of war. If North Korea becomes belligerent and fires a ballistic missile to our country, God forbids, is there basis to declare martial law? But, uh, we, Your Honor, uh, <laughs> that contingency may not even happen, but if it does happen, then we have to meet that situation uh, squarely, and one of the reactions could be uh, a declaration of uh, martial law if subsequent to the uh, uh, missile attack. All right, I'll, I'll, be... I'll take one step backward. Supposing North Korea becomes belligerent and announces through the international media that they will invade the Philippines and they have started sending boats, is that right already for the declaration of martial law? Uh, that Since was, imminent danger is no longer in the Constitution. Uh, that was uh, mentioned and deliberated by the Constitutional Commission, that precisely that kind of situation. And uh, the answer is that uh, uh, if that uh, threatened invasion really becomes a reality, then the President can declare martial law. All right. Uh, one last question to Congressman Nagman, and then I will yield to the other uh, members of the court. The executive department, through the president, on the basis of intelligence information given by the military and the attached agencies, have made a conclusion that there is basis for the extension of martial law. Now, both houses of Congress acceded and gave permission to the extension, 240. You're now asking 15 members of the Supreme Court to overrule the joint resolution of Congress and of the President. What do you think will be the effect of that? Your Honor, it is not a question of numbers. It is not a question of numerical ascendancy of the Congress at the behest of the President that is in question. It is a, it is a matter of determining in other words, whether both the President and the Congress uh, uh, had a sufficient factual basis okay. for the extension of martial law. In other words, if we come to the conclusion that the act of Congress in acceding to the extension is unconstitutional, it is not enough. It is enough that we make a declaration. Is that what you're saying? What we're but saying. But that, that might be a Pyrrhic victory. What we're saying, Your Honor, is both the President and the Congress failed to show sufficient factual basis for the extension, so much so that that triggers the jurisdiction of this honorable court under section 18 of article 7. Okay, thank you Congressman Lagman. Thank I you, now, Your Honor. I now yield to the other members of the court. Justice Carpio. Uh, Attorney Hilby, please. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Attorney Monsad, yes.
Uh, Chairman Monsod, is this in response to the question yes. of uh, Justice Tiham? Justice Carbio, let's yield first to. Yes, may, he I, wants to ask that, may I respond? He wants to answer that question. Sir, to, to your question of the Constitutional Commission. Yes, why, why is it still in the Constitution? I know that uh, yeah. there are a lot of bad stories about martial law, not, even, not only in the Philippines, but in, in other countries. But why is it still in the Constitution? Uh, yes, we talked about that, Your Honor. Uh, in, in doing so, we were wa wanted to cover an extraordinary or exceptional situation. That's why the, the provision is specific, extraordinary, and ultimate. Uh, and, you know, with no offense meant, uh, the Supreme Court decision of July seemed to think or seemed to say that it can be a measure of first resort rather than a measure of last resort. And you, you asked Your Honor uh, about uh, why are we relying more on 15 justices rather than 260 congressmen and 24 or 292 and 24 senators? Your Honor, that's the essence of the separation of powers and the system of checks and balances in our Constitution. And there is a vetting process by which those 15 justices are assumed to have the wisdom experience and the fortitude to stand up to the other powers of government and uh, there was a lot there was in the constitution when the institution making your honor uh, we probably overreach ourselves because we assume that that we had already uh, we were ready for a new society that's why this constitution the heart of this constitution is social justice, Your Honor. Now, with respect to martial, to martial law, um, you also raised the question of, excuse me, of, of, well, let me just say that in the Supreme Court, I was taught in law school, Your Honor, that the executive is the sword, the legislative is the purse, and this judiciary is the conscience of the nation. That's why we're here today, Your Honor. We have to decide cases along parameters which are clear under the Constitution, which goes back to my previous question to Congressman Lagman. Why is it that the provision on the review of martial law in its extension is limited only to the sufficiency of the factual basis. In here are the petitioners raising the matter of grave abuse of discretion, possible human rights violation. Were this not taken into account by the framers of the Constitution? Why were this not explicitly stated in the Constitution? Well, Your Honor, I contend that even without the uh, the power of judicial review. Section 18 stands on its own. And because uh, the, uh, the uh, martial law is supposed to be an exceptional, an exceptional case, we limited and limited and limited, in other words, closed, closed, closer and closer made that window smaller for the declaration of martial law. We, we took away imminent danger, we took away uh, uh, sorry, um, insurrection. As a matter of fact, there was a motion uh, of Senator Padilla to that extent to put in insurrection and that was voted down by the Constitution. Was it better to just delete the entire provision on martial law? No, that, that's what I said because while we could not delete it because we wanted to cover that, 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 op that occasion when there mi it might happen, we made sure, we thought, that we had narrowed down that window for using it and that it would not be this the section would not be used in fact to liberalize and open that door more uh, and, and no offense made your honor when the supreme court deferred to the president uh, things like you know we don't have the capability to do this and it's only the president who has the the uh, logistical uh, reach to do it uh, it, it 
when you, when you read it and you say, what about the modern, you know, the modern advances in technology? What about your power to subpoena? What about your, you know, your power to validate and uh, the facts, and not just leave it totally to the president? In 1986, uh, Your Honor, terrorism was not yet at its height. Was this taken into account? Which one? Sorry? Terrorism, Your Honor. Terrorism. terrorism. International terrorism. No. It what? is also a threat. Correct. To the country. Yes. But it may not, it may be sub subsumed, I don't know if it can be subsumed under invasion or, or rebellion, but what I'm saying is, if there is credible, reliable information available to government through the office, through the executive department, and there is a credible threat, threatened danger or risk to public safety, but since we eliminated already the phrase imminent danger thereof, that does that dispossess the president the power? No, Your Honor. To declare because, martial law. You know, because the, the president has control of all the armed forces and actually there's total discretion on his part there. But we are talking about a situation where civil courts and civil government are unable or cannot function. Uh, that is outside the ordinary obligation or task of the military. And that's where you need a special provision to provide, uh, to give the commander-in-chief with even executive order powers, as already mentioned earlier, that kind of power to deal with the situation within the context of the Constitution. One last question. There are safeguards in that Constitution, despite the provision on martial law. The civilian courts are still functioning, even with the declaration of martial law. Well, no, no well, safeguards. Yes. That's the reason so why. So I think the so the argument of uh, some of the petitioners, including uh, Solicitor General Hilbay, about a, the necessity of a theater of war yes. as a last as a last resort. Why was it not inserted in the Constitution by saying that martial law can only be exercise if there is an actual war. Why was it not uh, included in that? I, I know, but you know, Your Honor, during the deliberations, that was made clear already by Father Pernas, who was, who was the one uh, defending or, or, uh, that, that particular provision. And if we, if we put in the Constitution all the nuances and the intent of the of the commissioners in in the letter of the constitution we would have a constitution that's 10 times as thick as it is now thank you sir